Hi, my name is Erica Fellon, and today I'm going to be talking to you about exited tick effects on deer mice hemoglobin levels across populations of varying tick exposure. So let's talk about parasites, specifically ectoparasites. Ectoparasites can affect ecosystem diversity and play a role in population regulation, both as a disease carrier and a food source. Many parasites carry diseases that they can transmit to their hosts, which can then be transmitted to new parasites, and the cycle continues. Ticks are one group of organisms especially prone to transmitting zoonotic diseases. It is not common for just one parasite species to be present on a host, and since many ectoparasites are blood feeders, they can affect their hosts physiologically and behaviorally. As the climate warms and certain ectoparasites expand their geographic ranges, they may encounter inexperienced or naive populations of their host species, potentially altering the dynamic of the ectoparasite community on the host, as well as the physiology of the host itself which can in turn affect the overall ecosystem they inhabit. For my own research, I focused on the relationship between deer mice hosts and the ticks that parasitize them, specifically deer ticks and wood ticks. Deer mice are found across North America. They are an important host for larval and nymph ticks, who require blood meals in order to reach their next life stage and help to establish new populations. Because this mouse species is so widely abundant, they are one of the most common hosts for ticks, which make them an exemplary study species. Wood ticks currently have a larger geographic range than deer ticks in Ontario, and are known for carrying zoonotic diseases such as Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, though this bacterial disease is not prevalent in Ontario compared to other provinces. Although at the larval and nymph stage, the wood tick tends to prefer the same host that the deer tick does, adult wood ticks tend to feed on medium-sized mammals, such as raccoons, dogs, and coyotes, though they do often bite humans too. The deer tick is named so for feeding primarily on white-tailed deer as adults though they are quite the journalists and have been known to feed from over a hundred different host species. They are arguably the most medically important tick species. Known as the vector of Lyme disease, they can transmit this bacteria to their hosts, which can include humans. Here I have the current and predicted geographic ranges for both tick species. Both species are currently established in southeastern Ontario, though the deer ticks range is more concentrated in the south. Both species are expanding northward, with the deer tick expected to establish populations in northern Ontario in the next five years. For this reason, deer ticks are of special interest to my project, as they are considered the newcomer to Ontario and can be extremely harmful to humans. Since deer mice are an important host to ticks in their early life stages, understanding how ticks are currently affecting mice can help us to make better predictions on how these ticks will affect inexperienced hosts that have not yet been exposed to deer ticks. Since there are some areas in Ontario that have both deer and wood ticks present, other areas that only have wood ticks present, and some areas that have neither species present, it is important to compare these populations now to better understand how the presence of these tick species may alter the potential host populations in the future. I sampled three sites with varying tick establishment levels. The first site is Long Point, where deer ticks have been established since the 1970s and wood ticks since the 1950s. The second site is Queen Elizabeth Wildlands. Deer ticks have not yet established here, but there is a high density of wood ticks. The third site is Algonquin Park, where neither of these ticks are currently present and the mice are considered ecologically naive to these species. Since the current distribution of both tick species will expand northwards as the climate warms, it is important to document the relationship between deer mice and their ectoparasite communities now, while there are varying degrees of tick establishment, to better understand how these relationships may change as the tick species ranges expand and they encounter naive populations of not just deer mice, but other potential hosts. To better understand this parasite-host relationship, I measured the hemoglobin levels of the mice. Since ticks require blood meals from their hosts, they are directly affecting the hematology of the hosts, so I wanted to determine if hemoglobin levels of deer mice vary at different levels of tick exposure. I hope to gain a better insight into the differences between experienced and ecologically naive hosts that may encounter these parasites, which may alter the host's quality of life. I specifically measured hemoglobin because it is a more sensitive measurement compared to red or white blood cell counts. Previous studies on birds and rats have shown that even when blood loss occurs in a host, cell counts will not reflect a change in the host's blood, but hemoglobin will. Low hemoglobin levels can also indicate if an organism is suffering from iron deficiency or related diseases, such as anemia. This project has two main hypotheses. The first being that mice parasitized by a greater intensity of ticks will have lower hemoglobin levels at the individual level, since more blood feeding is occurring. And the second is that hemoglobin levels between populations will vary because mice at different sites have been exposed to ticks for different lengths of time and intensity. I predicted that Algonquin mice would have the highest hemoglobin levels since they were not being impacted by ticks, 
whereas long point mice would have the lowest hemoglobin levels since there were two different tick species present. Queenos with wildland mice are only parasitized by wood ticks, and I predicted that this population would have the greatest within population variation, where mice without ticks would have higher hemoglobin levels compared to mice with ticks, again due to the intensity of blood feeding. I traveled between the three sites for May to August, collecting data one week at a time from each location and then repeated the cycle two times. By traveling between the sites, I was able to collect data at different times during the summer to account for seasonality that may affect hemoglobin levels. At each site, I trapped mice, counted and removed their ectoparasites, and took a blood sample from each mouse, which was measured in a hemoglobin meter to record hemoglobin levels, before releasing the mice back in the wild. 45 hemoglobin samples were collected overall, though as you can see, there is an imbalance in data collection here, specifically in Queen Elizabeth wildlands. There is also a vast difference in the number of ticks collected at each site, with Longpoint having nearly 7 times as many ticks as Queen Elizabeth wildlands. It should also be noted that one individual mouse from Algonquin did have a tick found on it, though this was a squirrel tick. This species is not found at great intensities or frequencies on deer mice, though it is common in Algonquin. Other blood-feeding ectoparasites were also found, including fleas and mites. Using a Tukey's Honest Significance test on an ANOVA comparing the hemoglobin levels between sites, there is a significant difference in hemoglobin levels between Long Point, where there are both tick species, and Algonquin, where there are neither species. On average, mice found in Longpoint had the lowest hemoglobin levels, and mice in Algonquin had the highest. The significant difference between Algonquin and Longpoint is clearly defined as there were no Longpoint mice found without ticks, and only one Algonquin mouse was found with a tick. In contrast, the difference between Queen Elizabeth Wildlands and the other two sites may not be significant due to the high variance in hemoglobin levels. Looking specifically at this site, though, there is a large difference between hemoglobin levels when mice are infested versus when mice are not but this difference was not statistically significant, again due to high variance. Analyzing data from all the sites combined, I found using a general linear model that when the number of ticks increases on deer mice, hemoglobin levels decrease significantly. When looking at sites individually using the same methods as earlier, mice from Longpoint were affected by ticks more than mice from either Queen Elizabeth Wildlands or Algonquin. However, these results show that ticks were not significantly impacting any of the populations. There are other variables that need to be considered to determine what is affecting the hemoglobin levels of the mice the most. In Algonquin, the focal species of ticks are not present, so it is not expected that ticks would play a significant role in determining hemoglobin levels. Based on a stepwise AIC, a model including the age of the mice and the presence of mites was determined to be the strongest explanation for what is affecting hemoglobin levels. However, these results were also found to be non-significant. Queen Elizabeth Wildlands had a small sample size and hemoglobin samples were only collected from mice with low tick abundance, so the results here are lacking in power. This may explain why the null hypothesis was the strongest explanation based on a stepwise AIC. In this case, there is no variable that best explained what was affecting hemoglobin levels, although it did appear that the host's weight may be playing a role. Long point produced the most interesting results, as the only site that has two species of ticks, it's not only the number of ticks in general affecting hemoglobin, but the number of ticks from each species. When both species are considered together, the number of ticks does not affect hemoglobin levels. However, when considered separately, both ticks on their own significantly impact hemoglobin levels, but their interaction does not. All other variables considered had no significant effect on hemoglobin levels. This is especially interesting as there is a clear difference in the abundance of these ticks on individual mice, with the abundance of wood ticks being far greater in general in long point. The mean intensity of wood ticks is nearly three times as much as the deer tick intensity, and over 93% of the mice in Long Point were infested with wood ticks, and 77% were infested with deer ticks. Despite the wood tick presence in this population being greater than the deer tick presence, both species had a significant effect on their host's hemoglobin levels. Similarly, on an individual level, the abundance of ticks is shown to affect hemoglobin levels significantly, which makes sense since when more ticks are feeding on a host at one time, more blood is lost in turn reducing the hemoglobin level further. When comparing the populations, it is unclear what is significantly affecting hemoglobin levels in mice from Algonquin and Queen Elizabeth Wildlands, but the abundances of both tick species individually are significantly affecting hemoglobin levels in long point, even though deer ticks are not as prevalent or intense at this site compared to wood ticks. The reason behind why deer ticks may play a significant role in the hematology of deer mice in long point, despite their low intensity, could be because wood ticks have been established longer in this area, so the mice could have a greater resistance to wood ticks compared to deer ticks. 
Another factor could be that the diseases that deer ticks can carry could be affecting hemoglobin levels in deer mice more than the blood feeding itself. One such disease that deer ticks can carry is babesiosis that does in fact lower hemoglobin levels and could be the actual effect we are seeing. Because zoonotic diseases were not tested in this project, this cannot be determined unless further research is conducted. Overall, hemoglobin differed at different levels of tick intensity, though the most significant difference was between a population with a high infestation rate and a population with little to no infestation, suggesting that low infestation rates do not impact deer mice detrimentally on a hematological level. Tick abundance may contribute most to hemoglobin level differences on an individual level, though only one of our three sites supports this claim. Deer ticks at low intensity appear to affect hemoglobin levels similarly to wood ticks at high intensities, possibly due to the bacteria deer ticks carry or a difference in the host resistance to deer ticks relative to wood ticks. Our results suggest that deer mouse populations that will soon be introduced to deer ticks may have hemoglobin levels decrease more substantially compared to when wood ticks are introduced to a new mouse population. The susceptibility to tick infestations and their effects has the potential to alter ecosystem processes that can ultimately affect other host species as zoonotic diseases are transmitted from mice to ticks to other host species at higher trophic levels, including humans. Thank you for listening to my talk, and thank you to all those who have contributed to this project.